there's an endless list of reasons I should sing your praise. You've showered me with blessings all along the way. And Lord, I'm so grateful for you all who are so faithful to me. You've poured out your goodness and my cup overflows. You've covered me with mercy and satisfied my soul. Bread and living water, you are the friend and the father I need. And if my world should crumble, and sorrow comes to call from the ashes I will testify you're with me through it all Lord I love you I worship you for you Lord I love you I worship you If the road that I must follow is a road of loss and pain, I'll choose to give you glory. Yes, I will bless your name. I will be your witness even when I'm driven to my knees. Cause even if you lead me, not choose to go if it has to be Gethsemane I want the world to know Lord I love you I worship you for you Lord my heart aches to make you should crumble and sorrow comes to call from the ashes I will testify you were with me through it all Lord I love you and I worship you for you Lord I love you Worship you for you. Amen. Thank you, Miss Haley. <clears throat> it's a great concept in that song to worship the Lord just for being the Lord. And He's worthy of our worship, He's worthy of our praise. And uh, I'm thankful that we serve a God that we can worship just for being God. And uh, we don't worship Him because of uh, the things that He necessarily gives to us. Uh, although he's far greater to us than we could ever imagine, we could ever deserve, and we do love him because he first loved us, we know that, but he is worthy of our worship because of his character and because of just who he is in and of himself. Go back to Galatians 4 tonight if you would. Uh, <clears throat> I want to finish the thought that we have. I want to finish this chapter out, and really, uh, you're going to find, as so often it does, this chapter is really going to lay the foundation for the next chapter. You know, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll give you this, I'll have you stand. You know, there's a lot of times that we, that we read verses and they're so familiar, uh, but when you go through a, 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 a text, or you go through a book, and you go through it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, <clears throat> when you get to that familiar verse, a lot of times, and most all the time, that previous portion of that chapter really unlocks what that verse is actually saying. Uh, it prevents us from just pulling a verse out and saying, oh yeah, well that, that makes a good theology. Um, and so you're going to find when we get particularly to chapter number 5 and even over into chapter number 6, I, I believe that the foundation we've laid in chapters 1 through 4 are really going to bring out some of these details of the familiarity in the passages that, we, that we're used to and we'll be able to see what's, what's, what's really the heart behind 
those texts. Uh, some of them, you know, it talks about use not your liberty for cloak of maliciousness. Uh, we'll talk about liberty in chapter number five. We talk about uh, if a man be overtaken in a fault, if you as your spiritual restore such a one. Uh, we use that oftentimes, but when you see it in the context of why it's given, uh, I, I think that it'll, it'll really give us some insight on, on what Paul is really trying to get across uh, to the churches of Galatia. Stand with us tonight. We're going to read these two verses again. We read verses 19 and 20 this morning. We're going to do the same tonight, and then, uh, and then we'll pray and ask the Lord to help us. I appreciate how the Lord helped us in, this, in the service this morning, by the way. I felt like we had a really good service, just a good move, uh, good move around the altar uh, before and after service, and the choir did a great job. Special, specials were, were, were great. I just appreciate the Lord helping us this morning and hope that he'll meet with us again tonight. The Bible said this, My little children, of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. For I stand in doubt of you. Father, one more time we come before you asking you to help us. God, tonight, Lord, you know my, my, my faults. God, you know uh, the, the areas, God, that I'm lacking. And so, Father, tonight I ask God that you'll just move those things aside. And God, I pray that you'll have the preeminence in the service this evening. Uh, Lord, I pray, God, that you'll give me clarity of thought, the things that I've read, studied, and God, try to put uh, to, to into application in my own mind. God, I pray, God, that you'll help me to be able to deliver the message that you have tonight, God. As I stand here tonight, God, I'm fully aware of the fact, God, these are not my people. God, these are your people. And so, Father, we've come tonight needing something from your word. God, we need to hear something from heaven. And I pray tonight, God, that you would be gracious to us. Uh, and, God, you would do that. We know, God, you don't have to. And, God, we certainly don't demand that you do, but we, we sure do ask you, God, that you'll give us what we stand in need of tonight. God, and we'll thank you in advance. God, we know, God, that you're concerned about our well-being. You're concerned about our betterment. And, God, help us to look more like Christ. God, clear my mind of the things of yesterday, the things of tomorrow. Uh, God, I pray that you'll cleanse my heart once again. And, Lord, I pray, God, that you'll just, uh, just prepare me. And, God, use me tonight. And we'll thank you for all that's said and done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. <clears throat> Go ahead and be seated. Remember what we talked about this morning. How that Paul said, I'm really in a place, I, I'm, in, I'm in a place that I really don't know what, to, I don't know how to talk to you. I don't, know, I don't know whether to rebuke you. I don't know whether to pray for you more. I don't know whether to, 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 to talk more stern or to show more grace. And so I, he said, I really, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of bum fuzzled. I'm kind of baffled. I stand in doubt of you. And so he really didn't know how to deal with them. And yet uh, we find here that the Lord directs him and navigates him into this message. We talked a little bit about this morning uh, their unreasonable departure from the doctrine, how that they had walked away uh, in their minds because of the, these Judaizers that had come in. And so Paul said, here's the problem. Uh, you are sons, but you're living again as servants. Uh, God had a better plan. God, God's way is better than this way, and yet you have chosen to go their way rather than God's way. He said that, that it really doesn't even make sense. It really doesn't even add up. And so we talked about that this morning. And then we talked about their un unprovoked disdain for the truth. They had a problem. Uh, these, these men had a problem, and, and we'll see the why of that tonight. Uh, but they had a disapproval not only of, of, the, of the preaching, but they also had a disapproval of the person or the preacher, uh, that of being the Apostle Paul. Uh, and yet at one time, they had gladly received this message. At one time, it was a message of, of, of great excitement. It was a message of great motivation. It was a message that was well received, but because of false doctrine, they had a different outlook on that message. You know, that reminds me a lot of times that when, when an individual first gets saved, it's amazing uh, how, how sometimes when somebody's ready to trust Christ, uh, man, that is, that's the greatest news ever. And they'll, they'll come to know Christ as their Savior, but you let them, you let them get a few years down the road and, and uh, they're, 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 they're influenced and uh, uh, these other things come in play. And before long, that message that at one time was the most important message and it was the most life-changing message that they couldn't believe that God would save somebody like them and that God would do that for someone like, like that. Before long, there can be animosity that's built up, not only now toward the message, but also to the messenger. And so Paul said, listen, there's an unprovoked disdain for the truth. He said, I haven't changed but you have I haven't changed but there's a change that took place in you and so we're going to talk a little bit tonight about that change and we're going to go through some of these things and uh, I really have two main points that I want that I want to hit tonight and we're going to close in this in this chapter with an allegory or with an illustration that Paul's going to give to really drive the point home about what he's talking about, about being heir. All right, so let me, let me give you first of all tonight, but it would be third of all, uh, by the way, the message that we started this morning. I want you to see they're undeniably dangerous. And here's the word, you ready? Influence. Influence. Uh, and, and I want to I park for just a little bit on this thing, on this thing of influence. Uh, I, I think if we're not careful, 
we can we can become careless and allowing certain things to come within our circle. Now we think about it from a term from the aspect of a parent, and I would just tell you this, uh, parents, you ought to be very selective who you allow in your circle. You ought to be very selective who you allow in your circle. And I'm, I'm keenly aware of the fact that things are different now than they were when, uh, when, when I was even raising kids, let alone when I was coming up as a child. Uh, there's no way that, that our circle today could be as large and as vast as the circle that I was raised in. I can't, I can't fathom that. I can't fathom not, I mean, of course, you know, that was pre-cell phone days, right? Uh, that was back when they used to actually have telephone booths on corners at, at gas stations. Some of us remember those days. Some of, some of us remember when they were a dime. Yeah, it's been a while, okay? I do remember when the inflation hit, they was a quarter. All right, but I, there's no way I could, I, could let my, I could raise my kids now in the society that we live to where they're just gone from daylight to dark and know as long as it's not dark, oh, they're all right somewhere. And I mean, you know, we, we, you know we, were in, we were in the river. We were on the train tracks. We were riding four-wheelers. I mean, we, we were everywhere. Uh, but man, the world is nuts. The world's crazy. And so when our kids come along, we tighten the circle. Now our kids have kids, they've tightened the circle. Now it's just the changing of the times. Now I'm not preaching on parenting tips for, you know, for the for year 2023, but I'm telling you from a physical aspect, but also from a spiritual aspect, you better be careful who you allow to come into your circle. Right. Influence is a very powerful tool. Influence. You know what I found out? If you read after somebody long enough, before long you'll become sympathetic to what they're saying. If you listen to something long enough, before long you'll become sympathetic with what they say. If you watch something long enough, before long you'll become soft and sympathetic to what you're seeing. It's, that's evident in, in Hollywood. The things that at one time we, we would have got up and shut the TV off and thrown it outside, now we just sit through it and uh, just let it play. You know why? Influence. And I'm telling you tonight, influence can, 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 can creep in more than just in a, in, a, in a public setting, but also even into a spiritual setting and a religious setting. And Paul is warning them, Paul is saying something to them about their influences, about their influence. Now notice what he says here in verse number, verse number 17. He, he says in 16, remember we talked in 16, he said, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now, the, the, the leading in from verse 16 to verse number 17, uh, it, gives you the, it gives you the indication that by these two verses, uh, something had happened that had driven a wedge between them and between the Apostle Paul. Something had, something had we talked about the first, first, when we first started this series, that something has got to you. If you remember, we was talking about in that message. Someone, someone's got to you, and it's affecting you. Well, let me tell you, he's dealing with, this is why you're behaving toward me the way you are. This is why there's no longer that benevolence amongst us that was there when you first taught, heard, the, heard the gospel. This is why now you have you maybe have a, a, a bad taste in your mouth for me. He said, my message is the same. My appearance is the same. Uh, the, the things that I'm writing, it's the same. Let me tell you why that you now have turned, literally, you've turned your back on me. Let me tell you why you're rejecting me. And here's why it is, because they have zealously affected you. They have zealously affected you. Now, zeal in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, I wish we had a little more of it. I mean that. I wish we, our, our, listen, our church, I, I love our church, but our church could use a little more zeal. We could use a little more zeal on our singing. We could use a little more zeal on our faces. We can use a little more zeal on our, on our practice and our work. We can use a little more zeal as we go out into a community and tell people about Christ. Uh, zeal in and of itself is not a bad thing. Say, preacher, I don't need any zeal. I need that camera, brother. But Sean told me at choir practice, this is free. I'll give you all this, and I think it's a great idea. He said that we need to set cameras up here, and we randomly need to do it like they do at those basketball games when they put people's picture up on the big screen. He said, we randomly just need to hit people so y'all can see what you look like. <laughs> I think it's an awesome idea. We... Yeah, we get a lot of, we get a lot of, but listen, zeal, 
how in the world I got off on that. Zeal in and of itself is not a bad thing. All right. However, just because someone is zealous does not mean that they're staying, they're zealous about the truth. Right. Or they're zealous about good things. <clears throat> I'll, I'll promise you this. You will more than likely not outwork a Jehovah's Witness. You probably won't outwork one of them. They're zealous. The problem is, is they don't have the truth. But now they're going to share. They're going to spread what they have. They're zealous about it. Uh, yesterday, we, we, were, we were at home last night, and I don't remember what time it was, 7.30, 7.30, something like that at night. And, 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 you know, we live in a different day. I know that. Yeah, I'm aware of the fact that, you know, getting up on somebody's porch when it's starting to get dark, uh, it's, this is not 1980. It's, it's a little different now. And uh, this guy knocks on my door, and, and I'm creeping up to the door, and I'm looking, I'm looking at my camera and seeing, okay, who is this guy? And he's standing out, and he's, he, he might be 22. And so I'm thinking, man, this, this dude broke. But he's got an iPad. He's got a laptop. He's, go, he's going through all this stuff. And, uh, and I look out, and, and he starts with a, he's a bug guy. And he starts with his sales pitch. And I'm like, man, it is 7.30 on a Saturday night. You know, business hours are Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Call me back. If you want my business, call me back. But I, I wasn't rude. But I asked her I wasn't rude. And uh, the reason why is I, I need a better price than the one I got. <laughs> and so I listened to his whole thing. But I, but I could tell, listen, he was a salesman. I don't know what this dude's going to do the rest of his life. He was a good salesman. I mean, he was spouting off this and all this, and my company can this, and we're going to waive this. You know, listen, I'm like, dude, I ain't signing any papers this evening. I, you know, I'm, I'm almost in my jammers. You know, we ain't, we, we ain't signing nothing. You know, I'm, I'm done chilling for the night, and uh, so I got some information and all that. But, I mean, he was, he, was, he was very zealous about what he was selling. Now, zeal in and of itself is not a bad thing, but can I warn you something be careful just because someone is zealous that you don't migrate to what they're saying. You say, well, how do I tell the balance? They should have compared what they were saying with what the Apostle Paul had originally said. He said they zealously, look at it, they zealously affect you but not well. Now that, that phrase, zealously affected, what it's doing, it, it gives us the idea of, of not just that they were zealous but but how they came across as zealous. Um, do y'all remember what, we used to use words that are really before my generation. Now, now they talk about, you know, we're, we're dating or this person's dating or back in the 80s, you know, people were going together. Okay? But years before that, they were courting. People would court. It was something called courtship. All right? And so... To court someone, you know, there was a whole official process, which, by the way, is a pretty good thing. I think somebody still ought to come and ask you, sir, if they can take your daughter out. That's a good idea. Taylor, that's a good practice. Put that in. And make him feel as uncomfortable as you can. It's good advice. I'm telling you, that's good advice. Make him feel as uncomfortable as you can. Make him sweat. That's good for him. That's, that'll help him. That'll build character. But, you know, when they, when they come and, you know, they want to court somebody, but here's what they do when, now, get Dad out of the equation. When, it, when this guy's sweet on this girl, man, he puts on a good show on the outside, right? You know, hopefully he brushes his teeth and combs his hair. That's a great start. Fellas, if you need some help, that's a great start. And, and he goes and, you know, he's sweet and always so nice. Men can lie, by the way. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. <clears throat> they can be sweet. What was I saying? They can be sweet and nice. And what they're doing is, is they, are, they are courting. They are pursuing. They are going after something. And they are, that is the word, zealously affected. Uh, I can promise you this. When I was trying to get her to pay attention to me, I wasn't a jerk to her like I was to everybody else. I'm just being honest. I wasn't. I had her, I had her snow. She said, I do, and it all fell to pieces. But I mean, there was a courtship process. There was a, there was a zealously, oh, and you know, you've heard that mushy stuff on the phone. You're my everything in my whole world, and you're the greatest, and God made you just for me, and, y y and all that stuff. All right, this, that is the idea behind they zealously affected you. Now here, here's the sneaky part of that. 
the sneaky part of that is, is they, they knew that their doctrine did not align. Now let me tell you what we're having in our churches today. Let me tell you what, what we're battling. And I believe that what we ought to battle. We are battling outsiders, and, and they were battling here. We are battling outsiders who are now coming into our churches. And they are saying on the outside, oh yeah, we're just like you. We believe like you, we walk like you, we align like you. And then once they get in, here's what they're doing. They're beginning to undermine the teachings and the standards and the principles and the fundamental factors of the doctrines of Scripture. And they're, be, they're beginning to woo or to court those who at one time stood one way and now they're influencing them and they're literally cutting the legs out of leadership out from underneath them. We are seeing that in church. Now, here's my idea behind that. Listen, you believe what you want to believe, but if you do, don't sabotage the local body. Go somewhere else and, and yoke up an assembly like that or start one that's your own assembly rather than sabotaging what's already been fundamentally started. Amen. All right, we're living in that day, and that's exactly what was happening. These Judaizers were coming in. And listen, we're not talking about preferential things. We're not talking about things that really in 100,000 years are not going to matter. We're talking about salvation principles. We're talking about the principles of justification through faith and that alone. And they begin to woo. They begin to, to seek after. And so the first thing I have here is understand this. They were a target. Paul said, you've been targeted. Can I tell you something, church? You better understand as you're letting people in your circle, you better understand that somebody has got you in their crosshairs. Somebody wants to see you follow them and to follow the way you stand. Now you're going to find out they had some impure motives and we'll see that right here in this text. Paul exposes them. But you need to understand just how vulnerable we really are. <clears throat> this crowd comes in talking all nice and sweet. I'm going to tell you something. They got a target. They, these people were targeted and they really didn't. Paul loved these, this crowd. They didn't. They just wanted them to be a follower. And so I wrote down there they were a target. Uh, they were also tenacious. We use the word to pursue. To pursue. Uh, getting back to courtship, some of y'all in here, uh, the, the spouse, the, the, your spouse uh, didn't just, it might, it, it might not have been love at first sight. Miss Shirley, don't say amen. <clears throat> it might not have been love at first sight. I'm trying to help you, Mike. I don't know, brother. Uh, after that last comment, I didn't know what was coming. It might not have been, you, you, might have had to, you might have had to pursue. I have to call him and apologize after the service is over. Uh, you, you, you may not have, you, you know, so there might have been a pursuit that transpired. As a matter of fact, it might have been like you was the last person in the world they were ever going to be together. And then you say, what happened? Man, you targeted them. And you pursued them. And you wore them down. That's the process. All right, now, I understand. He said, listen, they've zealously pursued you. They didn't just happen to meet you. They come with purpose. They come with intent to undermine the doctrine that we had set forth before you. Now, remember, the significance of that was, what were they doing? They were putting law and, and trying to make it coexist with that of justification through faith. If you go back to the book of Acts and you go back to that passage to where, uh, <clears throat> where they're first revealing that, hey, the Gentiles had received the gospel. The Gentiles had got saved. Jews had a problem with that. Acts chapter 15, you're going to find there is a struggle between the Jews who believe that, man, we're, we're God's chosen people and everything rises and set. And Paul comes back and says, hey, and, and Peter comes back uh, as well and says, hey, uh, we've preached to these Gentiles. They got saved. They've accepted the message. They've received the Holy Ghost. And man, they were some, okay, if you're sure. And so this crowd of Judaizers were setting forth to go back to saying, hey, you, now you need to become like us. Okay, that's fine. You can get saved. What were they doing, man? They targeted them. They began to pursue them. Be careful who you let in your corner. People do not always have the purest motives who you let in your circle. People do not always have your best interest in mind. And so uh, we see they were zealously affected. But notice this. It was all temporary. They were targeted. They were tenacious, but it was all temporary. You say, what are you talking about? Look what he says here. He says, they zealously affect you, but not well, not for the good. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. In other words, here's what they say. They're, that word excludes means they'd shut you out. So imagine what it was like. Here this, here this crowd of believers are, 
They've gotten saved. They've trusted Christ as their Savior. They have joy. They have rejoicing in their heart. They know that they're headed to heaven. Uh, everything's about Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not about the Jew and the Gentile. It's just about being saved, being part of the body of Christ. And so therefore, these Judaizers, in order to gain their support, guess what they had to do? They had to say, oh no, you're not, you, didn't, you can't really get in. We, we love you. We have the solution, but you can't really get into heaven the way you are now. What you need is you need you need what we have to offer. So they would exclude you. They, they, this crowd, they let, they'd kick you out of heaven. They, they'd keep you from, from going on. They would exclude you so that you now might what? You now might pursue them. That you might affect them. It's the same phrase as, as, as zealously, uh, zealously affect. In other words, here's what they say. They say, you can't have it, you can't go. And then they walk away so that you're now following after them just to try to glimpse. But why? Because they've destroyed your hope that you've had. And so I'm telling you, you better be careful who you let influence your circle. You better be careful who you allow to, to, to come into your, to your ears. Who you allow to come into your, to your head. Who you allow uh, in the chambers of your heart. You say, why? Because I'm telling you, they can influence you. There's a couple guys that I like to read after. And I don't mean, some, some, of, the, some of our fellows in here know uh, who they are. But there's some of them that I read after. And uh, I don't mean to try to be funny. But you kind of read with one eye open. You know, you, you're kind of watching them. I know we don't line up on everything. Okay, I know. And, and because of that, I, I try to read I, I try to read in variety. Now, this is not, I just want you to understand where, where I'm coming from. You say, why is that? Because I don't want their influence to be the sole and the only influence in my life. Right. Now, I am keenly aware that there's other people going to heaven besides independent Baptists. Right. Don't let that shock you. They really are people going to heaven besides independent Baptists. There's really people that love Jesus beside independent Baptist. I know we're not supposed to say that, but that's true. Now, I'm not going to take independent Baptist off our church name because we're independent Baptist by conviction. But what I'm saying is this. I may be able to read after a guy and glean some thoughts and glean some truths from that person. However, I want to be careful that their influence does not permeate to such a fact that I'm, I'm now drawn away. You understand what I'm saying? Be guarded. Be careful on what you love because influence is a powerful thing. So what was he talking about? Uh, uh, the, their undeniable, undeniably dangerous influence. He said, they zealously affect you but not well. He goes on to say this. It's a good thing to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I'm present with you, Paul is not only saying, listen, you've got to be my little followers and nobody else's. That's not what he said. He said, but you've got to weigh how and with what are they affecting you with. And so Paul goes on to expose that. And then he goes down to verse number 19, and this is where we're going to get into our last point, and we'll wrap the, the message up. He said, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So he takes them and he says, Okay, here's the problem. You have, you have, you have, you have, you have departed from the teaching uh, unnecessarily. You're living as, as servants rather than sons. You've departed from that. You've allowed this negative influence in, in, into your life. Uh, you've now had, a, that's caused the disdain for the truth and the preacher of the truth. And now there's this animosity against us. And, and it's just not a good thing. All of that comes because they've zealously affected you, but not well. But then Paul says, but my little children. You know what it is? He said, listen, I still love you. I still care about you. Uh, it's almost as, as, as a, a, if a parent, and I don't believe he said it in a condescending fashion, but it's almost like w when a parent still deals with their child even after their child sticks their tongue out, slams the door, and stomps to their room. They don't stop loving that child. Now, you're going to have to discipline that child. Hello? You're going to have to discipline that child. If not, they're going to be 22 and mean as a striped snake and in prison and everything. You're going to have to discipline them. All right, but you don't cease to love them. You don't disown them. Paul says, my little children. Paul said, listen, you've got animosity toward me, but I have none toward you. I, have none. I just want you to get back on course. I want you to understand that God called you to live a higher life than what you're living. All right, so he says, my little children, he said, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. All right, let me, let me give you this. I, I, got, I got notes written everywhere. There's some words that I want us to understand in this verse. Uh, that, that phrase, travail and birth, it means exactly what it sounds like it means. I, 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 don't, I obviously I don't understand what travail of childbirth is like. I'll never understand it. Thank the Lord what it's like. All right, I've witnessed it, but I've never experienced it. 
But Paul uses that illustration as, as such, and, and, and Scripture often, often uses that about, uh, even about the, the, the pains of that. And, and, and Paul uses that as an illustration of just how much that, that he labored for them. Uh, but he says, notice this, he said, how I travail again. In other words, here's what you see. Paul said, he didn't ju- I didn't just quit laboring with you and for you and over you once, you once you got saved. He said, I'm doing it all over again and all over And I will keep doing it over and over and over again until you reach this level of maturity. You know what Paul's saying? Paul said, listen, I'm not in this thing just to get a little following and just a little, a bit, a little bit of numbers. I want to see you mature into Christ. He said, and, and yes, I labored. He mentioned about the fear of laboring in vain. But Paul said, I'm still laboring. I'm, as as uh, I travail in birth again uh, until Christ be formed in you. So I, I think it shows, it shows us and reveals to them Paul's genuine love and his genuine burden. You know, if you're a teacher, or, or I would say this from a, for, or a pastor, or anybody in leadership, a youth worker or whatever, uh, it's, it's hard to explain the burden that you have for those that, that's under your responsibility. It's hard to explain that. It's hard to explain... Um, I've always heard this. Well, you, you just can't take it personal. Well, I, don't know how to, I don't know how not to do that. Brother Chuck, I don't know how not to take it personal. I don't, I don't know how not to take it personal. Now, now listen, I've got a little thicker skin probably than I used to have. Uh, I, I do understand people are people, and you can't please everybody. Most of the time, you can't please most everybody. I, I understand that. But, man, it's hard not to take it personal when you watch people that you've poured your life into just all of a sudden one day say, you know what? And they go on. Man, it's hard. People that you've wept with and you've cried with and you've prayed with and you've, you've succeeded with, you've failed with, you've, you've worshipped with, you've wept with. And I'm telling you, it's hard to say, okay, I'm not going to take that person. You say, why is that? There's a burden in your heart. for the, You love that person. You love that person. Parents, you never lose the burden you have for your children, ever. You never lose that burden. That, that worry when you're up, it's, it's amazing. I worry when my kids were little. I worry when my well, preacher, you should have prayed, not worry. Well, you work on a book, and 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 I'll skim it. <laughs> you know, you're you're concerned about your kids when they're little. You know, and and, and this, my, you know, they get a fever and they're sick and they're just they're just a baby and they don't feel well. And you pray and you you labor and then all of a sudden they get well and then all of a sudden they they get hurt and they skin their knee as they get a little older and that worry's still there. Then they get older and they get in a relationship and some bonehead breaks breaks your heart and then you're you're concerned about that and want to kill him and and you go through all this burden. Then they go off to school and they got this big test and they don't know and they call home and they say, you know, I'm not sure if I how I did and I really need to pass this class. And so you begin to pray, dear God, they need to pass this class, then they get married and, and, and now they have the, I, I'm just telling you, the burden's there. You know why? Because they're your children. Yeah. You don't carry that hate and, man, I hate I got this burden. No, you love your kids. And it shows us the heart. Paul said, my little children, I'm burdened. But listen to where the, the end goal is. It is not I'm, I'm praying for you until you look like me. I'm, I'm burdened for you until you act like me. That's not what Paul said. He said, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. That is a level of spiritual maturity that Paul said, this is what I want. So I looked at that word form. What it means, and it's, it essentially means, and I'll just give you the, the simple of it. He said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm burdened for you until your mind and life be in perfect harmony with the mind and life of Christ. That's a big goal. He said, I'm burdened for you until your mind and your life are in harmony with the mind and the life of Christ. In other words, that Christ is your everything. Not the works of the law, not circumcision, not the feast, not the days, not all those things, but until Christ and you are in perfect harmony. He said, I'm burdened. That's his goal. And so he tells us his heart. That was not the goal of these Judaizers. The Judaizers said, I want you to do it my way. If you don't do it our way, you're not doing it at all. All right, and so we see Paul said he's travailed. In birth. And then look at verse number 20. Now this gets back to our text verse, and then and I'm just going to give you two quick things about the, the allegory, and we're done. Verse number 20, he said, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. You know, sometimes you don't get things. I, I've learned things the hard way, uh, particularly over the, last, over the last couple of years. Sometimes you can't always convey your heart through a letter. You ever gotten a, you ever gotten a text and you're trying to read into what somebody meant in a text? how they meant it. Now, 
listen, let me, let me, for you younger generation, if you get a text from an old person like me and it's in all caps, don't panic. I mean, I know that that's supposed to be like, oh, they're yelling, they're upset. No, it just means that our fat fingers hit a button and we was too dumb to realize it until we hit send. All right? All right. But it's hard to get the tone from someone on the text because in and of itself, a text is designed to be short, sweet, to the point. Right? It's also kind of hard to see in a letter sometimes the heart behind somebody. But man, when you're in their presence, Paul said, here's what I want. I wish more than anything I could be in your presence. I wish, I wish I could read the situation. You could hear me. I could hear you. I could know how all this is going to pan out. He said, I, I would rather my heart is to be there. He said, and to, and to change my voice. He said, listen, I, I would love to get there and find out things aren't as bad as what they seem in the letter. I would love to get there and find out exactly what you need that I could tell you and I could point you. I could make two, one apple plus one apple equal two apples and for you to get it. He said, I wish I was there. Now, he said, I'm not. It's going to be a while for him. I'm not there, but I wish I was there. But he says this. He said, and to change my voice, for I stand in, in doubt of you. Now, again, uh, Paul said, I, I just don't really know where to go. So he goes from a man that don't really know where to go to saying, I tell you what, here's what I'm going to do. Let me tell you a story. Maybe this story will paint the picture. Maybe this story will get now... Remember the, the first part of this chapter? It ends in chapter number 3. It goes into the first part of chapter number, chapter number 4. And he talks about the significance between being an heir and being a servant. Right? Their struggle is they think that the Judaizers have said, okay, you're not an heir by Christ alone. You, become, you, you get this inheritance through Christ and through the law. And so you're going to have to make a choice. You're either going to get it through Jesus or you're going to get it through Jesus and the law. But you are going to have to decide. They had chosen, okay, we've got Jesus, but we're also going to follow these Judaizers and we're going to have the law. And they were waiting for an inheritance that they're never going to get because it doesn't come that way. And so Paul says, let me tell you a story. And he begins to talk about the story and he uses the illustration. It's an allegory. It's a little different illustration. Uh, but he uses the, 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 the account in Scripture about when Hagar and Sarah gave birth to two children. You remember that you know, we have Ishmael and Isaac. Now we know Isaac is the promised seed, right? And so he said, okay, here's two stories. He said, now as he goes down through this story, he talks about how that Ishmael would be a type, if you would, of, of the law. Mount Sinai, I talk about the law, it's the rock, it's the stone, it's, uh, and there's a lot of preaching in that. I'm not really going to take a lot of time, but he basically gives two characters, Ishmael and Isaac. He said the law is Ishmael. The law is it. Now, the Jews would, would acknowledge we didn't come through Ishmael, okay? The law, Ishmael. He said promise Isaac. Law, Ishmael, promise Isaac. And so here's where he, goes, he makes this very plain. The first thing about this lesson, number one, uh, whether or not you're a servant or a son. Whether or not you're a servant or a son, we are a son by virtue of birth. In other words, we're either going to get the inheritance of, that, that comes from the law or we're going to inherit, get the inheritance that comes from that of promise. All right, now the Bible talks about here in this, in this text of, of chapter number four that the law gendereth unto bondage. In other words, that means it reproduces bondage. It, it, you, you, it, it makes offspring of bondage. But promise... Uh, listen, it, it's, that's where we have our inheritance about being a son. Uh, uh, Martin Luther wrote, wrote this way. I don't read a lot about Martin Luther, but he says this. A son is an heir, not by virtue of high accomplishment, but by virtue of his birth. His birth makes him an heir, not his labors. Now, when you look at this, what, that's exactly the opposite of what the Judaizers were saying. They said, you, you're going to become an heir if you keep this, do this, uh, if there's circumcision, if there's the feast, if there's all these things. If you act like us, then you get it. No, no, no. That's not how you get to become an heir. You become an heir by birth. Man, that makes us think about chapter 3, verse number 29. He says that if you be, the, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Uh, then he goes on to say in verse number 7 of chapter number 4, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God, look at it, through Christ. And so I become an heir because of sonship. Now here's the last thing. If you go down to the latter part of this, of this text, as Paul makes his conclusion, he said, your sons, your sons by virtue of birth, and number two, but you cannot be by virtue of both. In other words, those two boys couldn't live together. 
Ishmael and Isaac, go to Genesis 21. When you get home, read the account in Scripture. What did Sarah say? Sarah said, he can't be, he can't be an inheritance with my son. Abraham, you got to get second time. You got to get him out, Abraham. He can't stay here. Abraham was grieved. They were both his boys. Abraham was bothered. He was grieved in that. And the Lord said, hey, it's okay, Abraham. You need to let her go. They can't dwell together. It's the same premise here. Listen, you can't, you can't have both. You can't, it's either all Jesus or it's all law, but they can't live together. Now, the law does not produce life. The law produces death. The law does not produce, uh, does not come of promise. But justification through Jesus Christ and that alone, that's how we have our sonship and our heritage and our inheritance. And so as Paul drives, draws this picture and he uses this universally understood account of uh, Ishmael and Isaac, listen to where Paul lands. He says in verse number 30, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. All right, and he stops the sentence there. And he says, okay, now you get it? I've given you, I've given you the, the, the picture. I've made it as plain as I can. Let me give you one more illustration to paint the picture. You can't, they can't live together. They can't live together. Works and works and works and, and faith or works and grace can't live together. It's either all grace or it's all works. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God when we talked about it in an earlier passage. But listen to where he comes from. Verse number 31, he says, So then, since they can't live together, so then. He says, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the what? Free. But of the free. Now, basically, he draws a line in the sand and said, listen, it's, we're not children or heirs because of what these Judaizers say. We're not of the bondwoman. We're of the seed of promise. We're of the promised seed. And from here, he's going to springboard into chapter number 5 and verse number 1, where he says, stand fast, Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Not the law, wherewith Christ. And that's Lord willing where we'll pick up. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be a couple of weeks. I might hit it on a Wednesday night. Uh, listen, be careful who you, who you allow your influences, who you allow in that circle. You say, well, they, they can't draw me. They got in here. There's been more than one church destroyed by a little bit of influence. More than one family destroyed by a little bit of influence. Be careful who you allow in your circle and understand the significances of this allegory. We are, we are, if you're saved, you are saved. You're a son, not because of your good works and your good deeds and all that stuff, but because you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Let's stand tonight and uh, we'll, be, we'll give a quick verse of invitation. Maybe tonight the Lord's dealt with your heart and I don't ever want to take for granted. I know it was, tonight was kind of a Bible study type of feel to, as we finish the, the chapter out. But as Miss Stephanie will come to the piano, maybe the Lord worked in your heart and done a, done a work that you just want to come and, and talk to him about. The altar's open. You've, you're at liberty to do that. So if she plays tonight, uh, I'd like to invite you to come. I'd like to encourage you to do that. Mind, mind the Lord. <clears throat> I'm thankful tonight that our justification is not based on how well we keep the law. It's not based on my nationality, my birthright, my heritage that way, it's because I've been born again through the blood of Christ. Can you say that tonight? Do you know? If not, make it sure tonight.